That's a bit hard. That's, okay, a, well, that's the hardest question of the lot. I can... I can remember one particular day at the football. Princess Park, it is freezing cold, it is wet, and Fitzroy were not going that flash. Uh, and I thought to myself, why would you make it even more doubly difficult? But your old man did. He was standing there in his tracky dacks and thongs. There was, and he, and he had this bloody jacket on with this pathetic little hood that he pulled out of the collar. And he stood there from start to bloody finish and drank several studies. And uh, we ended up, I think, winning. Uh, great difficulty, but he did it twice as hard as the blokes on the field because he must have been bloody freezing. I told him he was an idiot, but anyway, never mind. So uh, it was, yeah, it was. I remember the first time meeting him was when uh, Brendan Murphy brought him down to Geelong, and uh, yeah, the guy certainly had an awe about him. Uh, you know, whether it be a, an arsehole boss or, or an old BL, he, when he entered a room, everyone, everyone stopped, you know. He just had that, uh, and respect. He had the respect from both sides, which was a, a hard thing to do in the industry, especially with its, with its cut and thrust amongst, uh, you know, the old us and them. But he certainly had the respect from both sides, yeah. We'll go into this meeting, and um, I've heard of John Cummins. Um, I never actually met him before that, but... Um, you can see him coming towards the mass meeting and the presence of the man was just amazing. Um, and everybody sort of, you know, looks up to Johnny and it was just amazing how everybody's tune changes when Johnny was around. There's a massive uh, group of building workers um, that went to that rally opposing, I think, a wage freeze or whatever. And I remember my father who also had a fair bit of restrict, uh, respect and could normally control a group and I remember him turning to John Cummins you know really relying on him saying hey you've got to take control of this situation again showing um, that the sort of respect that John Cummins had amongst working people um, that he could you know control a huge crowd in both what he said and also because of the respect and trust that they had for him. A terrific orator you know like really very very good on the stump it was, it was sometimes it was, it was you know, I think he could probably uh, rev people up to run through brick walls. And as we've known him in recent times, people would run through a brick wall for John. And uh, I suppose no one could ever forget that first, that night when the police come to break the picket at um, East Swanson Dock. And um, after everyone had been up all night, you know, it was like the cavalry came the next morning, you know, and John and um, construction units had 3,000 people down the other end of Anderson Road in between us and the police, so. Um, Anyone who was there that night will never forget it, you know. Uh, it's not just sort of sprouting the words when you're on the back of a truck or in front of a microphone or in a crowd. It's that late night, early morning, freezing cold, we need help and come I would deliver. Feel wonderful though, John. You know, they, they felt confident if John was leading the campaign or John was involved in a campaign, we all wanted to be part of it because we know we're going, to, we're going to go all right because, you know, he would steer in the wrong direction, you know? Uh, there was no pretense about the, about the man. I mean, it's hard to say, I mean, this industry, I suppose, men in general, it's, it's full of egos, but uh, you never saw an ego with John. It was, um, he was always measured in the way he spoke, so um, even if there, was, if there was members or union officials or bosses having an argument, uh, he'd often stay silent for the first five minutes and uh, he'd always think before he spoke. And uh, I think that was one of his assets. It was, uh, there was nothing fake about him. He was measured and uh, everything he said and everything he did was, you know, for the cause, you know. And in 1979, Donny Fraser fell 25 floors from a um, uh, landing bay at Collins Place and he had three young children. And about a week or two later, Normie Nicolofa, the Black Prince of Fiji, a bloke, great scaffolder, really, another great character, fell as well. And then uh, there was another bloke that I didn't know, another builder's labourer. Three blokes got killed in about three weeks, Dad, Daddy, in a way. And uh, I think that was when we all 
started to go, hang on, we don't go to work to get killed, this is rubbish. And John led the way, uh, not and not in a ridiculous, uh, over the top, not going on with uh, so much the, uh, what would you call it, the mechanic, the, the philosophy of it, but just doing it on the job, making where you went to work safe, so you went home in one piece. Uh, John, you know, I know he'd been injured pretty badly in an accident as a young worker himself. Uh, he'd worked at the Westgate Bridge in the, in the wake of its uh, collapse, so he, like a whole generation of workers, had, had the consequences of bad safety burn into his psyche and into his soul, and um, he was hard on safety, as you've always got to be hard on safety on the job. Oh yeah, he had uh, he had some great uh, great sayings, and um, you know, especially if somebody was injured at work and uh, the boss was having a bit of a whinge, um, his great saying was, "You fucked him, you fix him." Um, and uh, you know, as, as far as safety, um, if if guys were working unsafely, just shut the shut it, shut that section of work, and uh, don't think twice. It was really clear about come home and the work that he did on safety was again about saying there's nothing more basic than delivering safety for workers because you can win all the great battles in the world but if you're putting your life at risk uh, there's nothing more important than to know that you're going to get home at the end of the day. Uh, well I suppose probably the construction industry in Melbourne is probably the best organised um, section of unions I believe in the country. That that's probably the legacy he's got. You know, every building site's a, is a, got a genuine union, not, not not a union that stays away and gets paid by the boss. It actually, stays up, sticks up for the blokes, you know, and fights for their rights. So I suppose that's a, the real legacy of John. You know, the condition he's left his union in. It's up to us now to make make sure that that legacy is not taken away. Well, it's really amazing, even though it's been so long since he died. I I do often think of him in you know, difficult political situations or union situations and um, take um, inspiration from that. You know, every day, well, <clears throat> I know I've got a couple of camo t-shirts and um, sometimes things on the job don't go that well. Um, and I know, you know, it might sound funny, but I'll put one of my camo t-shirts on and you sort of go to work ready for a battle the next day and <clears throat> in a little way it helps but it's all it's all about remembering as well. I know during the Union Solidarity years if I was going to a blue and I knew that it was a, a bad one and I was feeling like uh, you know pretending like I was absolutely fully confident and in charge but shitting myself I, uh, I used to have this thing in, the, in you know whether it was at night or in the morning when I was driving there and I'd um, uh, you know I'd, I'd sort of imagine in the car with me that there'd be Come out, with Kieran Nichols, and you know Marco Marsis, and all that, and we're all headed off there together. You know what I mean? And it might sound funny, but uh, yeah, that was. You know, you could do that because of the way they live their lives, and you know that you you know you're just just uh, one link in a long chain, and uh, how good that feels. You know. I love him. He was the best man to talk, the men to help the people, help build his labors. He was created to help build his labours, as the person he was. Whilst at the same time, I know, I know John until his death, um, and, uh, and it'll be the same with me, and hopefully my kids and grandkids, is that you, you know, you're there in the struggle for a better world, not just a bigger share of this one.